did your doctor tell you that you need to titrate up every four weeks because that's what they did in the clinical trial? Well, let's talk about clinical trials and why that's wrong. Hey everybody, it's Allie. I'm on a fantabulous weight loss journey and hopefully you'll come along for the ride. So as many of you know, who have been on my channel for a long time, I am always going to say, talk to your doctor when it comes to titrating up. There are certain things that you need to be aware of as an educated individual who wants to advocate for their own health. And I think that it really dawned on me today that people are unintentionally clueless when it comes to clinical trials and medical studies and what they mean and how to take that information and apply it to yourself. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about this in depth so that we can all kind of get up to speed because I think that people are under the misunderstanding that a clinical trial is the end all be all and you have to follow it to a T and it's not and that's not what they're designed for. So let's talk about clinical trials, specifically when it comes to medications. Many, many, many medications go through various trials, through various phases, in order to come to a baseline, both about dosage, about side effects, about people who have severe side effects, about how well the medication works, right? All of these things are being tracked over time. And it's important to remember that a clinical trial only has a set amount of time. So they're not doing a clinical trial that's gonna last years and years and years and years and years unless that's specifically what the clinical trial is about. For example, they have done nutrition trials where they have followed people over the course of 10 years right? Okay, that was part of the parameters of the trial. They're not going to do that for medications because obviously they don't want it to take 10 years to get out on the market. So these clinical trials specifically for GLP-1 meds are designed to create that baseline, right, for safety and to give both doctors and patients a jumping off point to be able to start the medication and on how to use it. For example, when it comes to uh, Manjaro, if you are looking at the titration schedule that first came out, it shows people moving up in dose every four weeks. Why is that? Well, because they found that because of side effects, it was challenging for people to A, start out at the highest dose, or B, to titrate up any faster than that. So it's not just an arbitrary number, it's what the data shows. Now, what they didn't do in this clinical study is they didn't study people who were hyper responders or even just responded well to the medication if they were on a dose and it, that dose specifically continued to work for them they did not keep them on that dose they moved them up every four weeks right because they're trying to get an overall picture they're painting the big picture. They're not painting the little picture. They're not looking at the specifics. You have to think of it like an impressionist painting. When you stand back from an impressionist painting, you're like, wow, that is a gorgeous scene. But then when you get up close and you see the brush strokes and you get up very, very close to it, you're like, well, this looks like a jumbled mess of a bunch of colors. 
right? And that's part of the beauty of the painting. But it's also a great metaphor for looking at clinical trials because when you stand back and look at the information, you're like, okay, this is a great baseline from which we can go forward. Perfect example, when they did these studies, they were not looking at treating sleep apnea, high blood pressure, heart conditions, kidney conditions, weight loss, right? They were looking to treat diabetes. Now, all of those things have slowly been coming along with it, but it wasn't part of the initial study. So when you take all of those factors into account and then you do the research on top of that by yourself, you will find that the people who have been on these medications since the beginning, they tell people, if there's one thing that I could change, I would go back in time and I would not try trade up as fast as I did. Because at this point, on this day, there, it only goes up to 15 milligrams, specifically for Manjaro, Zepbound, Trizepatide. And once you reach 15, that's it. That's all she wrote. So once you stall out at 15, you basically have to just stay on the medication fight with your insurance company and try to hold out until higher doses come available or the insurance company kicks you off, depending on your condition that you're treating, right? So specifically for people who are on ZepBound that are having it covered by their insurance, and their insurance companies have all of these stipulations about you have to lose a certain amount of weight each month, right? Like all of these hoops that they're making people jump through. Then on top of that, it encourages them either intentionally or unintentionally to hurry up and max out to lose the most amount of weight, so they think. But then once they max out, that's it. And then the insurance company goes, ha ha, joke's on you. That's as much weight as you're gonna lose. Great, we're gonna take you off of it now. Bye. So happy you have a normal BMI. Toodles, right? So do we need to look at clinical trials as the baseline to get us started? Yes, absolutely. But as we go through the process and we learn and we learn from others, right? There has to be room in there for you as your own health advocate and also for doctors to say, hey, this clinical trial was great, but it doesn't cover everybody right? According to the clinical trial, I am an anomaly. Of course, I picked a really difficult word for me to say, <laughs> right? Because I was able to lose 38 pounds on 2.5, which they say is just a starter dose, right? To introduce you to the medication. And now I've been on five milligram Manjaro for many, 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 many months, and now I'm up to 78 pounds lost. And if you take that information and then apply it to what they found in the trials, they would say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's an outlier. That's a, you know, anomaly. No, I, I'm actually not. There are quite a few people who have had the same or similar experiences. I love to reference um, the woman who lost 136 pounds on Manjaro 2.5 and she never went higher than 2.5. And I think she said it took her 15 months 
She wasn't doing any crazy diet. She wasn't doing any crazy exercise. She was getting in movement, right? The medication just worked for her. But see, there's nothing about any of that in a clinical trial, right? You have to do that research on your own. So I always encourage people, do your research. Do not just take things right at face value. There are a lot of nuances. There are a lot of, you know, these situations like myself and many others, right? Just like there are some people who have zero side effects the entire time and lose all the weight that they want to lose without ever having a side effect. By the way, if you're one of those people, I am so jealous. And I might be mad at you a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> right? They don't talk about that in the clinical trial, right? Because it's for a set period of time. There's a set number of people. They've got to they've got to meet certain criteria. They've got to, right? They're they're trying to get as much information as they can in a short period of time. So, clinical trials, great stuff. Is it the end all be all? No. Do you want to make sure that your doctor is up to date on the latest information? Yes. And if you're doubting that, then find a new doctor. I don't know why people act like they're married to their doctor. I got news for you. There's this thing called divorce. Okay? I cannot tell you how many doctors I have divorced in my life. Because... They said something that was rude. They didn't listen to me when I was in the appointment. They made me wait an hour just to be seen, right? Like, it is a service that you are paying for. And if they're not giving you the quality of care that you know through your own research you deserve, then it's time to find somebody new. Because I guarantee you, they're, they're a dime a dozen, at least in the U.S., right? There's one around every corner. Here in the South, I think there may be more doctors than churches, potentially. Don't quote me on that. So there's no reason to put yourself in a situation where you're having to deal with a doctor who's not supportive of you or who's not up to date on the medication and how it's being used or all of the various conditions that it's treating, right? And I know there's a lot of stigma that goes along with taking a GLP-1. And if you're getting any inkling of that from your doctor, kick them to the curb. Time to find somebody else. I was just watching a TikToker yesterday who was crying in the car after her visit with her doctor because they were not supportive of being on a GLP-1. Let me just tell you, if you are not a abrasive or who someone who does not um, enjoy confrontation, then absolutely have a good cry in your car and and never see that doctor again but if you actually want to make a difference then you need to get your medical records and i've mentioned this before get your medical records once you have your medical records write the doctor a letter address to the doctor send it to the practice not an email that the office manager reads to the actual doctor Explain to them what they did wrong and why you're firing them as your doctor. Because chances are you've never been fired by a doctor, but that's what they do. They send you your medical records and then they send you a pretty letter that says, hey, we've decided not to treat you anymore. I know, I used to work in a doctor's office. So you should do to them exactly what they would do to you. Because if you don't, it's never going to change. It's never going to change. And this person who was crying in their car about their terrible um, doctor's visit is a huge 
GLP-1 advocate. And she was like really kicking herself saying, I don't understand why I didn't take that moment to educate him. Because it's not your job, honey. It's not your job to educate your doctor. And chances are they're probably not going to listen to you anyway, unless you're lucky, you know, and you've got a really good doctor. Chances are they're not going to listen. But what they will listen to is whatever hurts their bottom line. So if you send them a letter and say, hey, just so you know, this is what you did. This is how you offended me. I'm firing you as my physician. And I'm telling all my friends and family. And I'm writing a review online and letting other people know that you're anti-GLP-1. That's the only way you're going to make a difference. Anyway. I got off on a tangent on that one. I apologize. I um, I just get really frustrated with people who stay with terrible doctors. So what have we learned? Clinical trials, great baseline of information, not the end all be all. If your doctor sucks, get a new one. And the most important part is you need to be your own health advocate. I cannot stress that enough. If you found this video helpful, definitely give me a thumbs up. If you haven't already, subscribe. I'd love to have you along for the ride. Make sure you check out my other videos where I give helpful tips and tricks that can help you on your weight loss and health journey. If you're looking for a positive only support group, I've got you covered. The link is in the description box below. And as always, be kind. Rewind.